Good morning. Good morning, family. Welcome to Two Rivers. Merry Christmas. We can say that now, like officially. So good to be with you guys. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, and I just pray that God would just move fresh in our hearts today and this season um, as we just anticipate um, who Jesus is and what he came to do um, in the world and in our hearts and minds. And so we just invite him here today to move in our hearts and um, let us worship God together.
Go ahead and be seated. Good morning. Uh, Advent begins today and is a season of expectation. When we prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ, Christmas is a season of celebration. When we joyously commemorate his birth. To be a follower of Jesus is to stand between his two arrivals. His birth in Bethlehem more than 2,000 years ago, and his promised second coming at the end of days. As we remember with joy the day that Christ came, we look forward with hope to the day that he will come again. Because of Jesus, we are people with hope, faith, joy, and peace, which are the four candles that will be lit during Advent. There may be sorrow now, but your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. There may be struggle and pain, but hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Our Advent focus today is the prophecy of hope and salvation in Jesus. Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at the time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. A song of hope reads, Come thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. While she lights the candle, I'm going to say one of my favorite verses, Romans 15, 13. It says, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace. Let's pray. In your loving kindness, Lord, may this Advent season focus us to your living hope. May the hustle of the Christmas season not lead us away from the hope we have in you. Limit distractions. Wake us from drowsy worship and show us a life that leads in love, compassion, grace, and truth. Awaken us to your coming and bend our thoughts to your joy and hope. Prepare our hearts and make room for you, you who restores all things. We know this Christmas season is not easy for everyone, so Lord, please shine your bright light of hope to anyone here that may be sitting in the darkness right now. And help us to be that light of hope to others when in need. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ladies. Thanks, worship team. Hello again. Um, I have some announcements that I want to share with you guys um, before we move on. Um, we have a men's breakfast Saturday, December 3rd. So guys, 7.30 a.m., bright and early. Uh, Jimmy Page will be there with us sharing, so I'm um, just excited for that. Bring your teenage son, college guys, um, men. And then secondly, um, we have, this is a fundraiser for our students. Um, so parents, you can drop off your kids for uh, Parents' Day Out. 
Um, that is 9.30 to 12 on December 10th. Um, $15 per family. They're going to have cookie decorating and just have fun together. Um, and um, it will help send our students to camp. And then um, Christmas Eve service is coming up um, in a few weeks. It's crazy. So we have services three this year, 2.30, 3.45, and 5 p.m. here in this building. And all are welcome. So bring your neighbors, your family. Um, we just would love to have any and all of you. Um, and then lastly, we have a Adopt-A-Family tree out in the lobby. Um, would love for you to grab a couple tags and just provide um, a toy for um, some families um, in the community for this year. So we invite you guys to do that as well. And you can bring them back to the church and put them under the tree, and we will get them to serve 6-8. So sounds good? Yay! Okay. Okay. Um, Next, I have a special guest that I want to invite up, uh, my friend Damar, my brother. Come on up here. Hi. <laughs> this is my brother, Damar. Um, so in 2017, we started a partnership with a church in Catadupa, Jamaica. So Catadupa is, when you think of Jamaica, you think of the beach. Catadupa is in the mountains of Jamaica. So you come into Montego Bay and go up, narrow, windy road. Um, it is an adventure just to get there. But we um, partnered with a church up there. We sent a team. Who's been to Jamaica? There's a couple. Okay, yep, yep, yep. Okay, yay. Yeah, man. Um, we sent a team in 2017, and then we went back in 2018 and 2019 and then had to pause because of the pandemic. But we are going back this summer and we are just so blessed and thankful to have this partnership with this church there and with um, these people um, who have become family to us. Damar has spent Thanksgiving three of the past four with our family. He actually lives in Florida now um, and is getting his PhD. I'm going to let him share a little bit about that. But um, we're just so thankful to have you. And um, my family has been so blessed and impacted by your life. And we're just grateful that you could be here with all of us. So if you could just tell us just a little bit about who you are first. Who's Damar? <laughs> Hello, everybody. I am Damar, as Lindsay Wrighty said. I am originally from Catadupa in Jamaica. I have been living in Florida for the past one, two, three, four years. I am a teacher there. I'm also doing my PhD six months left in Abaddon. I, as I said, I'm from Catadupa in Jamaica. It's in the mountains. It's about 17, 17 and a half degrees above the equator which makes it warm all year. So experiencing the snow here is a blessing. As I said this morning, uh, we predominantly speak Creole or Jamaica Patois, even though everybody understands English. Um, it's a developing community. We do not have all the resources that they would have wanted, but through the love and uh, um, the gift that God has sent to us, we are enjoying what is there now. Anything else? No, that's it, that for me. And what about your family? Oh, I am married, one wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, one son is two years and three months. Okay. And what, what are your plans? Um, you, you get your PhD in six months, and then what are your plans? What do you plan to do next? Well, my PhD is in counseling and consulting psychology. So I might be doing some counseling, working with um, the public school in Duval in Jacksonville, Florida, or I might go back in ministry. I have a passion for serving. I love young people. Or so wherever the service is offered, especially here, I might. So I am just here. Um, well, I'm just hoping that by the end I can do some form of service, whether in Jacksonville, in Jamaica, or right here in Colorado. We would love for him to come here, but that's just my vote. Um, and then we, so this partnership that we have developed with this church there, you know, relationship is so important, and it matters, and that's really what has um, connected us, is we are able to go and to serve the pastor there, Pastor Leroy. He does such an amazing job of 
um, serving his community and providing um, projects in the community to just for sustainability. Right now, I was chatting with him yesterday. Um, they're working on a chicken farm and to support the school, and the church supports the school. And there are also um, just, just, just different projects in the community. There's, there's a water project they're working on right now to extend the water line to have clean water. And so that's something that we can come and partner with and serve. Um, but what we receive is so um, impactful. I know that my life is forever changed. And Jason's talking today about family. And the whole time he was sharing in the first service, I was thinking about how that, that is how... Jamaicans do life, and that is how the church operates in Jamaica, is they, um, they love each other so well and so big, and they just share. They just live in community, and that is what we are so impacted by, because here we don't always get to live that way. We're so isolated and spread out, and so that's something that I have been so impacted by, and I'm just so thankful um, for, for how you guys have impacted our life and my family's life and people who have been. And so what... What would you say about that partnership and why that is important? Now, if you should come to Jamaica and ask about um, this church, they'll tell you a few things. They'll tell you fellowship. They'll tell you love. They tell you seeing God's active power at work. And one of the things is that we in Jamaica, we are a bit more theoretical. And when you guys visit, we get to see the practical work of God in the community we get to build relationships, and not only relationships, but lifelong relationships. When we think about um, the ways that you would have assisted the, the community, the ways that you, we would have seen God through your actions, through our communications, through your doing, it speaks volume. And I tell you, when they hear about um, mission groups coming to the community, coming to Ketadupa. It, it sparks a light because they know that God's active power, faith in action, the things that we have been heard about is going to come in action through your work, through communicating, through conversation, through the very fact that you are, your presence is with them. It speaks volume to that. And so we, we're looking forward for everybody. And as I said this morning, we can host everybody. So in the event that you are thinking, you're contemplating, just make it a, um, a date and be there. See God's active work. Get to communicate with families. Get to speak. Because, you know, one of the things is that as Christians, we're disciples and we're called to evangelize. And sometimes by our very presence, it speaks a lot to some families. Sometimes without even saying anything, you're there, it speaks a lot. And so we're, in, we're inviting all of you to come on board. We, we have space for everybody from zero to 99, 100. So if you want to experience Jamaica, if you want to experience the culture, and I, I tell you, I, moving to Florida was, a, was not so difficult as I thought because of the experiences that I had with you guys when you came. It was easier for me to make the transition into Florida. It was easier for me to understand the, the American context. It was easier for me to blend in. And I'm sure you go in there, there's, there's so much to learn. There's so much to do. There's so many ways that you can see God. And there's so many um, opportunities that will be provided for you to activate your faith. Amen. Thank you. We have a lot to learn from each other, don't we? Yeah, that's what's so beautiful. We just can sharpen each other's faith um, by this connection and this um, partnership. So thank you for being here. Um, like I said, this was Damar's third Thanksgiving with our family, and he's been to um, our church three different times, and each time we've been in a different building. So hopefully when you come next year, this is where we will still be. So thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Damar. I am also married uh, to one wife, <laughs> your sister, Lindsay. Uh, good morning, church family. Uh, good to be here with you. My name is Jason. Um, if you could open your Bibles to 1 Timothy 5 as we continue our series in the pastoral letters from uh, the Apostle Paul to his son in the faith, Timothy, uh, giving leadership to uh, the church in the ancient city of Ephesus, uh, part of the Roman uh, Empire at that time. Um, when, when we think about uh, church life and first century, um, 
Rome, Ephesus, uh, it didn't look like this. Uh, there weren't buildings to go to, pews to sit in, stained glass windows, uh, music teams with um, you know, sound. Uh, we sing, we fellowship, uh, somebody gives a monologue, we sing a little bit more, and then we go home. Uh, it was so much more rooted in uh, community and family and entire days. One of the things that Damar said in the first service, uh, Catadupa is a small little community. And he said, everybody knows everybody. And we, we have a lot to learn about the way they did church in the first century, with the way they do church in Jamaica as well. Um, when we think about church in first century Ephesus, they were meeting in homes. If you, do a, if you study uh, first century churches, Christian churches, they were house churches. They were small, usually 20, 50 at the most. I mean, if somebody was wealthy in their community and could host that many people, there might be up to 50 people, maybe a little bit bigger than that, we're not sure, but highly, highly, highly relational. Um, lots of teaching, lots of instruction, lots of sharing, lots of caring. Um, if there's a kind of a phrase or a theme of the morning in our passage, it's life together in the gospel. Uh, what does it mean for us to live life together in the gospel of uh, Christ? I want to start by just uh, reminding you of kind of a theme verse for 1 Timothy. Uh, Greg mentioned this last week. I want to uh, mention it again, 1 Timothy 3, 5. Paul is giving Timothy specific instruction on leading the church in Ephesus, and he says, you will know how people, us, the community of faith, how people ought to treat each other, how we ought to live life together, how we ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. And then the theme kind of truth of the series, and we talked about this week one, uh, is that our theology, uh, what we believe matters, but also how we move what we believe into our lives matters. And so our theology matters and our lives matter. And this series, these letters, is the intersection of faith and how we're living our lives together. Um, from last week, chapter 4, uh, what Greg picked up on was this phrase when Paul tells Timothy, train yourself in godliness. Instructive. Um, Greg said this, I, I love this quote, I wrote it down in my notes, training in godliness is becoming more like Jesus on purpose, that we're learning and growing and changing in the way of Christ. Um, I've been quoting uh, this commentator, uh, this is maybe the third or fourth time I've used this quote in this series, here it is again, what characterizes the pastoral letters most is not doctrine, is not right believing, he says, but doctrine blended with holy living. That's, that's what this instructive uh, letter is about from Paul to Timothy. Um, we talked about this last week. Anytime we come to passages of scripture uh, that are instructive, exhortive, um, things for us to understand about how we are to live our lives, there's always a danger uh, in and just adding more things to, to check off of our list uh, it can easily become legalistic for us. And so we're always wanting to remind you when we're receiving instruction, exhortation from Scripture, to receive it in the lens of freedom in Christ. We receive the instruction knowing that the truth of God's word is what sets us free. So, so understanding these exhortations and understanding these um, these lessons today, this instruction, is for our benefit, it's for our good, it's for training us in righteousness, right? Uh, and so I want us to receive it in that way. They are life-giving instruction. Uh, and responses to faith is a way that we experience God. Here's another quote from Greg last week. He said, he said uh, responsive obedience is freedom. If you want to experience Jesus anew, Look for a way to obey, trust him anew. Right, he showed that uh, clip from uh, Lord of the Rings when Gandalf says to Bilbo, Bilbo Baggins, did I say that right? And he says, like, I'm not trying to rob you, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to release you 
from things of your flesh, of the world that are burdening you, and I'm trying to invite you into the way of Jesus, which is liberating for us. So I, I just I want to say that up front as we receive the instruction uh, this morning that is for our freedom, for our good. Um, here's the outline we've been working through. Uh, we're going to be in point F today, Paul's instructions concerning relationships, Paul's instructions concerning social relationships, how we live life together in the gospel. And I would just invite you to consider, like, would you say that relationships in our life is important, it matters, it's valuable? Like relationships with people in your family, in your church family, in your neighborhood, people, right? Like, it's important. But would you also say that relationships require work and they are sometimes difficult, Yeah, so it makes sense to me why Paul would write to Timothy, who's leading a community of people from all kinds of different backgrounds, all kinds of different ages, all kinds of different socioeconomic situations, and he's giving them instruction on how to live together because he is leading Timothy in the way of Jesus. Uh, I do uh, a lot of premarital counseling. I think there are four or five couples that are recently engaged uh, in, at Two Rivers. Love is consistently in the air at Two Rivers Church. Uh, we, uh, we, we, you know, I think, I think the number is 23 babies in 2022, uh, four or five couples engaged. But one of the things that I tell young couples and every married couple in the room, uh, I think you will agree with me on this, I say to them, the question isn't in your, the question isn't if you're gonna have conflict in your marriage. You will, you will. The question is, can we do conflict in a way that is remaining connected with honor and respect and we're working together? That's the big question, right? Because sometimes in a relationship, we're not on the same page, but we're still on the same team. And I would say that statement, I, I, I believe we can make that same statement about a church community. Like we're not always gonna be on the same page, but we're on the same team because we're in the same family. And so relationships matter and it requires instruction uh, for us and work uh, for us. Um, We're gonna get a lot of instruction from Paul to Timothy today. We're gonna be in the first 16 verses. He'll speak about treating one another gently and not harshly, right? Like that's important for safety and community. And so he gives that instruction, taking care of people in the community who need our support and who need our care and who are on hard times and need actually financial help. Like that's part of how we are to live our life together, uh, having um, care that is honorable, uh, with purity, um, not with selfishness and not with hypocrisy. So that's that's some of the instruction uh, that we'll be getting today about living the gospel uh, together in a community of faith. So let's, let's go there. I'm gonna read the first couple of verses and then we'll read to uh, the rest of the ch- um, passage of the morning in just a few moments. But let me start by just reading the first couple of verses from 1 Timothy 5. Paul's giving Timothy instruction. This is directly to Timothy. And he says, do not rebuke an older man harshly. One of the things that he had told Timothy in chapter four is, hey bud, don't, don't let people look down on you because you're younger, right? Like, you have an anointing. Uh, we laid hands on you. There was a prophetic word that was given to you that you were to lead this church in Ephesus. Like, remember that. Own your calling. Own your gifting. But it's a challenge for a young guy to be in a church, and there's some older people there. And so he's like, look, own your dignity. Own your calling. Own your gifting. But when you have to rebuke someone older, just don't do it in a harsh way way. Like we want to do that gently because you're going to have to correct people as a leader, as a pastor. So do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. And treat younger men as brothers and older women as mothers and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Like treat younger women with all purity because they are your sister, your sister in Christ. Like we're a, we're a family, 
right? I mean, that's the language. He literally uses uh, the familial language. It's so clear, like fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters, and that's who we are as a church family. Social scientists have a label for a pervasive culture in American society, uh, and they call it radical individualism. Like when we think of just American culture, social scientists use that phrase to describe it, this movement away from belonging to each other, and it's just this radical way of thinking about radical individualism, and this kind of culture uh, can make it difficult to stay connected, uh, to embrace that we're a family, that we belong to each other, that our, our call is to serve each other and help one another and grow in our faith. And I would say to you pastorally, we must reject radical individualism as Christians because we are a family, amen? Like we must reject that we belong to each other. One of our three core values as a church is that we, we, we wanna cultivate an environment where we are family oriented. And that's part of what I love about a smaller church, uh, that we have an opportunity to truly like know and be known by one another, but it requires effort and it requires intentionality to move life beyond the pews and the brief, brief connections that we get in the lobby. Like I love the connections over coffee in the lobby and I love that we get to chat a little bit here but I think you'll agree with me, you're not gonna make friends by just showing up on a Sunday morning for an hour and a half. You make friends because you're sitting in someone's home and your shoes are kicked off and you're engaged in the question, hey, how are you? Oh, I'm good, no, 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 that's, that's, I'm sorry, let me ask that another way. How are you really? How are you really? What's going on? Like, that's, that's the mindset of, of, of embracing church as a family. Uh, in 2016, to cultivate this kind of culture, uh, I taught a six-week series uh, on this core value, and we just called it Family Matters. And we spent a lot of time, six weeks, talking about what I'm going to talk about with you this morning in one service. Uh, we think about the ministry of Christ uh, and what, what, how we see him operate in the Gospels, uh, chose the word family as a defining metaphor to describe his, his followers. Um, the Apostle John, in his letter, 1 John 3, 16, he says, Jesus laid his life down for us. We should also lay our lives down for our brothers and our sisters, right? That family language that Paul uses in 1 Timothy 5. And, 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 that, we, and that we treat each other gently, uh, not harshly, with all purity with one another. This is how Timothy was to interact as a leader. And this was the kind of culture he was to create, treating people well. I think that's instructive uh, for us this morning. So as we get into verses 3 to 16, he's going to take this family language, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, and he's going to instruct Timothy about a situation that was happening uh, in the church that needed to be shored up, that needed some attention, uh, needed some care, it needed some organization uh, around widows. And um, I want to give you just some context because there's a good bit of detail uh, in the verses that I'm not going to have time to unpack. I'm going to read the passage and try to give us some principles that I think are relevant for our life here and now. But let me give you a couple of points of context before we read these verses and some really specific and detailed instruction for Timothy on what was happening in that church then and there in first century Ephesus. And some of it you'll, we'll read and you'll be like, okay, that, I'm not totally sure what that means or what that is because there was a, a real life situation that was happening on the ground uh, in Ephesus. But here's two things that I think are important for us to understand. In the ancient Roman Empire, life was shorter, like in general. Um, you were considered old if you were in your 40s. And there were very few widowers, very few. And the reason why is because Ephesus, there was, there was, it was a region for the Roman Empire. There was a regional Roman governor in Ephesus. And a lot of the dudes were out fighting, fighting for Rome. And so being a widow was part of the reality 
uh, for people there. And so the social context of the church that Timothy was leading is there were a number of widows. Um, and, and we think of widows as elderly usually, but there were probably a good number of younger widows because their husband died at war. And so sometimes they were younger and sometimes they were wealthy. And let's just say like they didn't want to be a widow anymore and they were looking for some suitors, seemingly without a whole lot of purity in mind. Are y'all with me right now? And so Paul's addressing this with Timothy because this situation needed leadership and care and accountability. So that's the first context. Secondly, when we think about caring for widows, that was especially important in Jewish tradition, right? Uh, Deuteronomy 10, the Lord defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow. And we see this again in the New Testament, really a pretty well-known passage from James chapter 1, uh, religion that God accepts, God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Uh, and so with that reality and thinking about the social context of what was happening in the church that Timothy was giving leadership, here's a good bit of instruction on how Timothy was to lead this forward uh, in the church that he was leading. So uh, let, me, let me read through uh, verses 3 to 16, and then we'll talk about four principles that I think could be uh, helpful for us in thinking about our life together in the gospel uh, today. He says, give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. Uh, your translation might say, give honor, give honor. It's a twofold way of thinking about care. It's relational care, spiritual care, but it's also financial help. It's where we get the word honorarium from, give honor, give recognition to widows. And then he says, who are really in need, which begs the question, perhaps there weren't widow, there were widows, but maybe they weren't really in need, so there needs to be some discernment around who's really in need and who's not in need. Who's, who's taking advantage of the situation and who's really actually in the need of the church to come and support them. So we see that in verse three. Uh, we'll actually see that phrase really in need three times in our passage. So give honor, give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their, these children, these grandchildren of the widow, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. So if there's a widow in the church and her children or her grandchildren are there, they're the first line of care. And there's a call in their life to take care of their mama or their grandmama, to repay them for all the years and all the sacrifice and all the time and all the money over all the years that they poured into their children and grandchildren. The widow who is really in need and left alone, in other words, she, she doesn't have children or grandchildren there, puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give the people these instructions too so that no one may be open to blame. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Paul is getting pretty intense here in the instruction. Would you agree with that? Like he's basically what he's saying here is like, if there's someone in the church family and they're professing the name of Jesus and their mom or their grandma is a part of the community and she is in need of relational care or financial care and there's a refusal on the part of the children and, or the grandchildren to help, they're professing something that they don't believe. I mean, that's just Paul calling a spade a spade. And so, give the people, or uh, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. 
Verse 9, no widow may be put on the list of widows. We're not totally sure, honestly. I did some study on this. What does that mean? There was some list of care, some organized way of thinking about ministry where we're creating an opportunity to care and serve people. And there was some list that Paul is speaking to Timothy about. And he says, no widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60 and has been faithful to her husband and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list. For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. It's interesting because you look at that and you're like, is he talking about the first pledge or the first vow? Uh, Is there some other type of first pledge? Again, in doing a study this week, like scholars are like basically like, we don't totally know. We don't totally understand what's going on here. I don't believe that he's saying that they're not allowed to remarry because he'll literally say that in the next verses. But there's some sort of pledge that they made that they they broke. Um, And he's just calling out their dishonesty uh, here, taking advantage of their situation in a selfish way. He says, 13, besides they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house, And not only do they become idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things they ought not to. And then in verse 14, he says, so I counsel younger widows to marry. That's that's why we don't, I I don't think that it, it means when he says like they've broken their first pledge. There's freedom in that to remarry. And so he's giving the freedom there. I think he's calling out hypocrisy and selfish, selfishness and taking advantage of their situation. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have, in fact, already turned away to follow Satan. Verse 16, if any woman who is a believer has widows in her family, she should help them and not let the church be burdened with them so that the church can help those widows who are, quote, really in need. That's the third time. That he's talked about that. So, a lot of detail here. Um, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of, lot of things that we could talk about uh, here. I, I chose to maybe not try to get into the weeds on some of this stuff, uh, but just to offer some, some context. But um, plenty of stuff for you go, to go and study and look at later if you want to do that. Uh, again, what I want to do is offer uh, just some things for us to grab some principles from what Paul is telling Timothy for our life together here. If I had to summarize verses 3 to 16, uh, I, this is how I would summarize it. The basic concept seems to be providing care and financial help for the needy widows among the church family. And he's distinguishing between the needy widows and those who don't need it. Um, and so we, we heard that language uh, there. So Here's, let me just work through these principles. I'm going to offer four, uh, and then we'll try to move it into our neighborhood with some real practical stuff uh, at the end. Here's, here's the first principle. Uh, caring for those who are in need in a church family is not a suggestion. It's an imperative. Uh, the, the, the verb, the Greek word that's translated give proper recognition or give honor uh, is a verb imperative. Paul is giving instruction. This isn't just a suggestion for you. Uh, Timothy, like, we got to take care of our own people. Like, this is part of the call of God in our lives, that we're a family and we take care of each other. Again, it's twofold care. There's relational care, certainly, uh, but also financial help for those who need that. We see that in verse 4, repaying parents and grandparents, which is pleasing to God, returning that to them. So, uh, first thing, uh, this, is a, this is a reality. This, sh- this needs to be a normal reality for our life together in the gospel that we take care of each other, okay? Principle two, uh, the Im- this was interesting for me in thinking about this. The immediate family carried the primary responsibility of care. It doesn't mean that there's not a responsibility of care for the church to come alongside people in the church family, 
But those in the immediate family, the children, the grandchildren, those, the immediate family members, carry the primary responsibility. Uh, and again, the language in verse 8 um, got pretty intense, got pretty direct. Like, caring for, for mama or grandma who was a widow was a very practical way for them to practice what their faith was and a refusal to do it. Paul says, a refusal to step in and give this twofold care to their mom or their grandma who was a widow was basically Paul saying, you can talk to me all you want about what you say you believe, but if that way of living doesn't match up with your faith, you're not practicing what you're preaching, and I think is what Paul is saying here. Now let me say this. This, this reminds me that like verse eight and the intensity of that reminds me of uh, James's exhortation when he's talking about a faith in the book of James, when he says, faith without works alongside is really no faith at all. He, he says faith without works is dead. Same concept of thinking about that as Paul is speaking about in, uh, in our passage uh, today. So it matters. Like what we say we believe and how we live our lives matters. And Paul is saying, taking care of your mama and your grandmama it real, it, I, I would say my ma or my granny. That's what I call my grandparents. Like, it matters. And I was raised in a church that when I was raised in a family that way, like this familial kind of way of thinking, uh, it, it, it matters. It matters. Like, I, I feel that in my own, in my own life, uh, and I receive this instruction for us. Principle three, uh, the church, uh, there was something going down. Like, there's something happening. There was, there was, there was a uh, Unfortunately, when it comes to benevolence, sometimes, there's this thing called our flesh or pride that gets in the way. And so there needed to be some discernment and some accountability in the church because there was some, there was some stuff getting in the way of an act of benevolence from the church where people were taking advantage of it. And Paul's like, listen, we got to be shrewd on this. There's got to be leadership. There's, there needs to be discernment on determining who needs the care and who doesn't need the care. Uh, and so some organized way of thinking about care was, was created. There was a list that was created. Um, you couldn't be on the list if you were younger than 60. Um, you shouldn't be on the list if people in your immediate family could meet that need. Because if they could meet that need, then the resources of the church, uh, we could use the, they could use those resources to help someone else that didn't have immediate family. Does that make sense? So it, it, it's just this reality, like the church doesn't have resources to give someone in benevolence if they need financial help, if the family doesn't bring offering and trust the leadership to be godly stewards of that resource. And so Paul's just saying like, you've, you've, got, to, you've got to have discernment, Timothy, on how to be a godly steward of the benevolence that the community of faith is bringing so that you can steward that well and so that we're, we're offering the support and care to people that really need it. Does this make sense? And so there needed to be some structure uh, around that so they could be good stewards of those resources. And then fourthly, very similar principle, the church was empowered to make wise decisions to help those who needed it. Um, and we needed discernment around that. And there needed to be some accountability uh, around that, and Paul is leading Timothy to call these things to account. There's, there's idols, there's gossiping happening, or they're moving from house to house. There's like, there's all, there's all kind of stuff going on uh, that, there, that needed to be shored up uh, so that there's healthy honor and accountability and process to give people the care that really needed it. So these are four, there's probably more, these are four that, uh, that I pulled from this passage and what I want to do now is just think about these four principles in, in our life together in the gospel here today. And I want to pull back again and look at our theme verse and remind you how Paul tells Timothy we are to think about church. So when you think about two rivers, and he's writing these instructions to Timothy, he uses that phrase, God's household. You will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. And I want to emphasize the phrase God's household. 
God's household is not something that you just go to. God's household is something that you belong to. Many people think that Christianity is only a belief system, but it is also a belonging system. Yes, there are essential, important, doctrinal truths to embrace and to believe, but it's not just that. It means that you are a part of the family of God, God's household. You are part of the body. You belong to the family. Like when you embrace that Jesus is the Savior, he's the Messiah, he's a long-awaited Messiah, like we're celebrating Advent, like the long-awaited Savior of the world has come, and Jesus will come again, and so we're celebrating what has already happened with Christmas, and we're also anticipating and longing and believing that Jesus will come again and make all things new, and we are part of the family of people that Jesus came to rescue, and so we're saved into a family I've used this uh, language or this statement before, uh, and I want to say it again. Uh, Here it is, if you've never heard it before. Lone Ranger Christianity is a contradiction of terms. The expression personal savior occurs nowhere in scripture. We are saved into a family. Mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, You are to understand that the people sitting next to you, behind you, in front of you, they're your brothers and your sisters. And those who are older, we treat them like fathers and mothers and youngers like brothers and sisters. And we're to see this as God's house. Are y'all with me right now? This is not a place that we just come to. This is a place that we belong to. This is the people that we belong with. It's so important. It's so important. You need each other. I need you. You need me. Right? God, like radical individualism needs to go and embracing the beauty. And it's, it requires work. We're messy people. We're going to make mistakes. But showing up and letting people into your life is so important so that people can help carry your burdens. I, I, I feel emotional because um, I've been on the receiving end of that kind of care. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I, I do know. I, I could not, I would not be here pastoring, leading, standing in a pulpit week after week if I have not had the family of God around me when tragedy, struggle, pain, failure came into my life. And I have been on the giving end and I'm so delighted to be on the giving end when you are there and you invite me into your story, into your mess to say, hey man, let's, let's walk this out together. Having a relationship with God and not a relationship with his church is not part of God's plan and call in our lives. Listen, we're a mess. Can we just say that? We're a mess. But we're a beautiful mess. And we have the message of grace and mercy and compassion and hope and a peace that doesn't make any sense because Jesus came and he's alive. And he's the Lord. And so we can be present with each other. Um, the church as a family is primarily about relationships. Um, one of our life groups is studying a book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, Shane McCollum's leading that group. Uh, they're just journeying through the book Life Together. So I knew kind of like, hey, we're going to be talking about family today. We're going to be talking about uh, caring for one another and being in it with each other today. Like I just texted Shane, I'm like, hey man, what's, give me a few, like give me a couple of your favorite quotes from Life Together. Um, and here's one that he sent me that I, that I think is really, really powerful. It's again, Dietrich Bonhoeffer from the book Life Together, quote, every member serves the whole body either to its health or to its detriment. 
because we are members of the body. So we take care of each other to the health or we don't take care of each other to the detriment. That's just what it is. Uh, One of my favorite quotes around community, uh, we use this in our life group leader training uh, from John Ortberg. I've never known anyone who was isolated, lonely, unconnected, had no deep relationships, yet had a meaningful and joy-filled life. It's not good for us to do life alone. Would you agree? It requires, you got to risk the trust. And some of you, it is riskier than others because you've been burned. I just want to validate that. I want to say that out loud. Like you've done it, you're like, hey, Swain. My friends call me Swain, so we're friends. We're in the family. You can call me by my last name. Oh, there was, a, uh, there was an email that went to all of our life group leaders over, over I'm totally off my notes right now. Just, this is a fun, this is just a little side story. Somebody hacked into our email. Like they created an email that looked like my email, but it was like one thing off. So lame, by the way, so lame. And they emailed, I don't know how they got all of our life group leaders' emails, but they're like uh, talking about how that I needed gift cards to give people who were in need. (laughs) And so my phone starts getting bliss. JJ texted me, Shane texted me, uh, Chris Freeman texted me. I mean, I was was getting bliss. So, but here's the dead giveaway. Here's the dead giveaway. Ever who it was, they signed Pastor Jason Swain. And I'm like, anybody that knows me, Stowe, you're dying laughing. <laughs> yeah. Like, just call me Swain. I'm good with that. Like, I embrace that I am the pastor of the church, but you just call me by my last name. That's what my friends call me. So I signed the email. I was like, hey, just disregard it. And I think I said, like, the reverend of his holy justice, <laughs> Jason Edwin Swain. You know, it's just the dead. It's the dead giveaway. You know, like... I don't even know where I am in my notes anymore. I just want us to be in it together with each other. You know, like, I'm just a regular guy who cares a lot about you. And if you ask me to show up, I I will. Like, if you ask me to show up, I will. And I believe that if I needed you, I'm just looking at my brother Mike, like, if I, I just, you will. You will. And I go, that's, that's it. You will, you will, you have, you do. And it grieves my heart that some people in this room, they don't, they don't have a taste of that. And I'm just saying, stay here. If you don't have a taste of that, stay here. And let us into your life. We're not perfect, we're gonna make mistakes. I promise you, we're a beautiful mess, but we will show up. This, ha- we will show up. I, I just, I'm so passionate about this. Um, in my notes from that um, six-week series called Family Matters, uh, six years ago, I just had some things in here. I was like, oh, that's good. I'm gonna share that again. I just said, we are not interested in programs over people. Like, we're gonna do programs. We're gonna do events. Those things gather people. Like, we're gonna have a men's breakfast next Saturday. I'm gonna be here. If you've ever come to one, dudes, like, show up. Just come and hang out, meet some people, Right? It's, it's, it's great, but we're not gonna, we don't wanna do programs and events over people. Like, we wanna develop a community of people. We're not interested in short-term relationships. We, like, when I think about relationships, like, man, this is a long haul. Like, I ain't going anywhere. This is it for me. Like, this is long-term relationship. We're not interested in functioning as a spiritual vendor for spiritual wanderlust. And we just wanna share some life together and, be authentic and real. Uh, Rather, we want to be a family of people committed to sharing life together, serving together, honoring one another, giving one another care as we grow in the grace and the hope of Jesus. Amen? We embrace that Two Rivers is a family and we will seek to take care of our own. Twofold care. We want to embrace the twofold care in thinking about that Greek word that's translated, give special recognition and honor. We want to do that here. When I think about relational, spiritual, emotional, prayerful care, our leadership team, our staff team, life group leaders, prayer team, care team, River Kids volunteers, student ministry volunteers, offering relational, spiritual care to each other. 
We want to be available. We want to provide friendship, counseling, spiritual care. If you need care, we want to care. We want to show up. We want to be there for you. From a financial need care. Um, If you didn't know this, uh, our leadership team, our finance team oversees our benevolence fund. 10% of all the offerings that come into Two Rivers are set aside uh, in a fund, and we use the money in that fund to bless our ministry partners, Serve 6-8, Alpha Center, Catadupa Christian Fellowship. There are many others that we're in partnership with. We have a lot of people here at Two Rivers Church that are serving in full-time ministry and parachurch ministry. And we want, we want them to know that we support them and believe in their ministry and care. And so we, we support them financially. And also, there's benevolence money for people in our church family that need financial care sometimes. And we have a process to, to, to steward your generosity and your benevolence on your behalf to give and care for people in our own church family. And so that's happening as well. And that's That's the kind of life we want to live together uh, in the gospel. And I love passages like this uh, because it it, it helps us uh, think about that that value of family. And it's it's so important. It's so important. Uh, Worship team, you guys can come back up. I want to just close with a bit of a rapid fire of uh, New Testament uh, scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament scriptures Uh, that uh, speak about the essential value of community, of fellowship, of thinking about life together in the gospel as family. Uh, Some of these are going to be very familiar for you, uh, but I kind of want to just use this as as a conclusion, but also as a call to worship as we conclude our time together this morning. Uh, The the one that I think about first when when I... uh, think about like what it means to live life together. It's from Ecclesiastes. You're going to know this verse. Two are better than one, for if one falls, the other is there to lift them up. You're going to fall. I'm going to fall. We're going to struggle. We're going to need help. It requires, some, it requires some vulnerability and some risk. I, I hope and pray that we can develop trust that you will risk asking us to care for you when you need us to lift you up. I get that it requires trust, and we want to develop that kind of trust. Iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We make each other better. And sometimes it's speaking about things that we're blinded to. Like the proverb says, the wounds of a friend is better than a kiss of an enemy. And sometimes there's some blinders in my life that I need someone to help me with. I said something actually in the first service, and it was just something off cuff, and I basically was talking about, like, we don't want to do programs over people. So I just basically said, I, I, I don't want to create a culture where we're so busy with, pro, with programs that we miss each other. But I said something off the cuff that just a younger, younger brother, just like, hey, man, he goes, I... I think maybe that that could be, how you said it could be construed in an offensive way to someone in the room. I'm not going to tell you what I said. I didn't mean it that way, and I didn't even know that it could be construed in the way, but he's like, I've learned that in my life. And he's like, I just want it. And I was like, dude, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Just, just helping me see a little bit. You know what I mean? Sharpening, sharpening me. So in Christ, we, though many, we form one body, and each member, each member, you belong to all the others. For good, for hard, and everywhere in between, like, this is it. Let's stay in it together. Let's walk with each other. Let's rejoice. Let's mourn and everywhere in between. Amen? Like, let's do this together. It's too hard living life alone carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ a new command I give you love one another like Jesus is speaking to the disciples this is in John 13 this is the day before he goes to the cross he's like if you're a disciple you gotta love each other and when you love each other people who don't know me they're gonna recognize that you're with me 
And what is so sad and frustrating for me is that people have perspective of people in the church because they can't get along about what color the carpet is or some asinine thing like that. And they're just like, they, they can't. Like, what's attractive about a community that's proclaiming that we're the Jesus people, but we, can't, we don't even know how to love each other? We've got to love each other and be a witness to people. This isn't, this isn't burdensome. This is life-giving instruction for us. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received, and you have received a gift. Everybody in here has received gifting. Use that gifting to serve, to serve. Jesus said, the greatest are the humble servants. Be a faithful steward of God's grace in its various forms. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. This gathering, it should drip with encouragement. It should be the safest place for anybody to show up because it's just like, man, we're just here to encourage each other, help each other, serve each other, listen to one another, pray for one another. Like, but sometimes the church is like the hardest place for people to show up because their experience has been like judgment, I don't fit in, whatever it is, right? This, this should be the safest place for any person to show up. Encourage, 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 encourage. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude multitude of sin. Lord, would you do this work in us? Holy Spirit, we need you. We need you to awaken our minds and our hearts to the way of Jesus, the way of freedom, the way of liberation, to see people, to really see people, and to care, to serve, and to sacrifice. Would I pray for healing relational healing for any person in this room that has been wounded by church people. I just pray for healing, Lord, and I pray for, for a trust uh, in that fracture and a, and, a, and a courage, a fresh courage that we could be more fully known here in this place we could bring our true selves, our true questions, our doubts, our victories, our failures. Lord, thank you for the instruction of your word. I pray that it would be truly changing for us today, a light to our path, a lamp to our feet. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a couple of songs um, to close. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you the last one is It Is Well With My Soul. So, pretty awesome. Pretty rooted in a victorious mindset around faith. So I'm just, I'll give you that heads up. And Andrew Spada would never tell you this because he's humble, but the next song we're going to sing is a song that he wrote. And uh, it's a blessing to our church family. He's going to be mad at me because I just said that. Um, we're going to have some prayer ministry people available here during the last song. If you got prayer needs, they're available. They'll linger after the service. I will linger here after the service to pray for you. If you want to stand and worship, do that. If you want to be still and receive, do that. Let's respond to the word of God uh, together as we center our lives and eyes on Jesus.
Peace like a river flowing from your grace. Oh, how sweet it tastes. Come invade my heart. Come invade my mind. Do what you salvation the king of kings you have authority to come invade my heart come invade my mind do what you
About that song. Would you agree? Something about it. If you don't know the backstory of that song, the author wrote those words over the Atlantic Ocean, somewhere around the spot where his wife and his children perished. And so I love that song, but it's like, Lord, this song is dangerous. Like to sing the song, Whatever My Lot, 
you have taught me to say it as well. Come on now. It requires faith to see beyond the natural to the supernatural. And I think about Paul's words in Philippians where he says, like, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he says, like, I, I have experienced having plenty and I have experienced wanting. And I've learned that I can be content in any and every circumstance, which is crazy. It's breakthrough. It's crazy because it's not natural. Um, it's from another world. It's from heaven. It's from heaven. And that's, uh, that's how we say rooted, um, whether we're, we're rejoicing or we're grieving. Because we're not grieving like those people that don't have hope. Amen? And he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I proclaim the strength of the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to you. Um, Because when I get nervous about my family and I get anxious, I typically think about like the worst possible outcomes. Do you do do that? I mean, is that, is that, I think that's just like, and I have to take every anxious thought captive to the obedience of Christ and remind myself, this is not our home. We are pioneers passing through to glory with Jesus forever and ever. Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this ancient hymn that is so full of hope but so challenging, Lord. And so I just pray that we step into a supernatural hope today and that we would know and believe and be rooted in hoping in you does not disappoint us because your love has been poured into our hearts. We celebrate the risen Jesus who is alive and who sets us free. We pray in his name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Merry Christmas. Good to be with you. God bless you. Chandra and I will be available to pray with you if you need us. Have a wonderful rest of your day.